Last week, and we're in a three-week series on worship and praise, and it's going to culminate in next Sunday night. Hallelujah, you don't want to miss that, that time of intense praise and worship. We're going to have three worship teams that night, and I think it's going to be a very powerful time. In Psalm 100, which we started studying last week, it says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth, and serve the Lord with gladness, and come before Him with joyful singing. Amen. We learned a few things as we were studying that chapter. The first thing is we learned is we need to come with the shout, not wait to be stirred. There are too many people that come to church waiting for God to touch them or stir them. No, you need to come to church with the shout of praise. And you, do you know why you come? You don't come and worship. You don't come to give him praise because he touches you or because you feel nice or you feel happy. You come because our God is worthy to be praised. God is worthy of a shout. And it says you come with a shout. And it, it says all the earth, it doesn't matter what your culture is, it doesn't matter what your personal temperament is. You know, how many people really believe that there should be a Bible for excited people and a Bible for withdrawn, quiet people? And there shouldn't be all the shouting stuff in for the quiet, reserved people. God should respect our temperament. <laughs> He does it. He says, all the earth. It doesn't matter if you're reserved or not reserved. You shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Somebody say amen. amen. And say try it. You'll like it. I just want you to know. And this is, this is based on solid medical facts. Okay? You will not die if you shout. Okay, I'm pretty safe from a medical point of view to say, you shall survive. It doesn't matter how quiet or how reserved it is. So the Bible tells us to shout. It doesn't say come and be stirred. And if you really move, if God really does a good work in you, if you're just so overwhelmed, then give a shout. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says shout. Hello. It says come with joy. Don't be moved with joy. Come with joy. You come to God with joy. If you don't have any other reason but that Jesus saved you and forgave your sins, that's enough reason to sing joyfully to God. Can you say amen? Your house could be falling down. It could be on fire. Your job could be gone. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. You have a reason to sing joyfully. He saved your soul. Somebody say amen. And if he hasn't saved your soul, come run us to the altar. We'll lead you to Christ right now. Amen. Okay, many people wait for God to move them, wait for God to stir them. No, you come that way. You come to praise God. We learned last week that 85 times it says to sing unto the Lord. Here it says to sing joyfully. When you sing, and I mean actually let words out of your mouth. Singing is not, bless you, in your mind, not saying. That's not singing. Something, there's got to be noise that proceeds from your mouth. Notice it doesn't say make a, sing a beautiful song. It says make a joyful song. Okay, so you can sing. Now everybody knows, how many people here know that I don't have the best voice in town? That's why I'm not up sta- on stage when the music is happening. That's why I turn my mic off when I'm singing. I do, but I sing loud to God. I just don't want to overcome the people that have the gift to sing. But here we're not talking about leading in singing. We're talking about singing from your heart to God. And it blesses God. You are called to sing. Whether you can sing opera or you can't sing even in the shower. You are called to sing praises to our God. Does that make sense? But to sing, you got to let words come out. When there are words on the screen, they should be coming out of your mouth. Can everybody say, I still love you, Pastor? Okay. Sing joyfully unto God and bless his holy name. And you'll see what a blessing he'll bring to you. In Psalm 105, it says, The Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. There are three reasons why we worship God according to that scripture. And if you agree with them, say amen. The Lord is good. He's good, huh? God's good. Amen. His loving kindness is everlasting. It's always there. And his faithfulness is to all generations. Somebody say amen. Okay. Now, I have a question to you as we start this new message in this series. Both in the Old and New Testament. Can anybody tell me, and if you heard it from the first service, you can't answer. What is the first time the word worship is used where somebody worshiped the word worship is used 
in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It, just to give you a hint, it happened in both of the first books. So it happened in the book of Genesis and the book of Matthew. Can anybody tell me when the first time worship is mentioned? Anybody? Abraham worshipped. Okay, very good, Don. Okay, and then what was the scenario? What was the situation? Okay, he was going up to the mountain, and we can read this in Genesis 22, verse 5. You can throw it on the screen, too. It says, And Abraham said to the young man, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. It was when God told him to sacrifice his son. Okay, let me ask this question in the New Testament. When was the first time worship? You got it, Alexandra? When? Were you here first service? You heard in first service. Tell us anyway. The wise, the wise men. Okay, give her a hand, even though she cheated. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, thank you, Kurt, for setting the, 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 the thing straight. But um, how many people know when the wise men came, it says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have saw his star in the east and have come to worship. I want to share a few things. Um, that worship is very personal. And it goes deep to the heart of who the worshipers are. When you look at Abraham and you look at the wise men, when they worshiped, that was something that was huge in them. It wasn't like a side issue. That was part of their being. And it was just about the best part of their being. Abraham was a mighty man of God. But he was a mighty man of God because he worshiped the mighty God. And he was fearless in following and obeying God. This was the hardest assignment of his life. And what was he doing during the hardest assignment? He was going to worship. What gave him the strength to obey? Is he had a heart to go and Worship. Come on, help me out here. What, have you ever been in a situation when you knew God wanted you to do something you didn't believe that you had the, the strength to do what God was telling you to do? Come on, you're human. We struggle, don't we? But the reason he was able to obey God was he went with the heart to worship you, to worship God. And I want you to know if you live your life with the heart to worship God, God will give you the strength. Because as you worship a mighty God, you see a mighty God, and you get the strength of a mighty God, and he gives you the faith and obedience to obey him. But it starts with that heart. I'm going to worship you. You know, I've drawn a line in the sand. And in my life, I am going to worship God no matter what. If God blesses me, I'm going to worship God. If it looks like God's blessing isn't on my life, I'm going to worship God. If God gives me a good day, I'm going to worship God. If I go through a bad day, I'm going to worship God. It's, it's already set in stone. Somebody say amen. And that's the power that Abraham had on the worst of his days, and the, on an assignment given from God that was that you would just say, no, there can't even be. He decided he was going to be a worshiper. Can you say Amen. Hallelujah. A big part of his heart was that he was willing to lay down his life, his dreams and hopes before a mighty God. Because he was willing to worship in difficult places, he received great revelation of God. And if you study that, uh, 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 the first time it was ever said that he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord has provided. And God gave Abraham a name, uh, gave him a revelation of the character of God, that God was going to provide no matter what. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the one who meets all our needs. He's the one that has a sacrifice when we need a sacrifice. He's got an answer of prayer when we need an answer of prayer. He's got a heart full of love when we need a heart full of love. Hallelujah. When Abraham went to worship, he received the revelation of a great God. Somebody say Amen. Now the Magi, how many people know who the Magi were? Somebody tell me something about Magi. They were wise men, very good. They were students of the stars, okay? Do you also know that they were very politically connected? These were political powerhouses. The Magi were political brokers, all right? Do you know that these strong, mighty Politically connected men came with one main heart, 
And that was to worship and to acknowledge Jesus as the king. They probably had to travel about 800 miles, and it probably took them about six months. These men were on a mission from God, a mission to worship the king, a baby king. They left everything to worship. They were passionate about finding Jesus and worshiping. You know, a lot of times we think things that are so far from reality. So most people think that when the, the day Jesus was born, okay, that they, there was a star out there, and the wise men looked up at the star, and they, they said, oh, look, a king is being born. And so then they said, okay, let's load our camels and let's go see Jesus. Or the baby king. Okay, I don't see it like that. I see that when Jesus was born, there was a star. And they were looking up and they saw that star. And they said, wow, there's something different in the sky. It's telling us. And then I believe they went to their ancient books and they started to study. And I believe it took them about, about a year to a year and a half to figure out what to do and to plan their journey. And then they went on their journey. I believe it took about six about six months. And do you know when they got to see Jesus, he was about two years old. And if you read the Hebrew, the, the word that it doesn't say Jesus was a baby, it says he was a child and he was no longer in a manger. He was now in a house. That's just what the scriptures say. And, um, and, and, but what did they come? They, for about a year, year and a half, they planned a worship service. They knew that a king was being born. Hallelujah. And they knew they wanted to honor him. And they, 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 they made it the biggest of their life, the plan of their life, that was to worship that, that, that baby king. See, worship isn't something flippant. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, hallelujah, God is good. Hello. It's got to be our passion. I want to learn how to worship. I, do, you know, do you know most mornings when I wake up, besides reading the Bible and praying, I, I, have, um, I go on YouTube and I get worship services and I worship the Lord. One of my new faves is Worship Mob. It's actually a worship team called Worship Mob. And, um, and it's just really good worship. And, um, and it's just powerful. Hallelujah. But it, these men planned a worship service, and they planned gifts to give in worship, and the humility as they were thinking about what a great, mighty king must have been born, that, that it was declared through a star in heaven. You know? King of the ages. And they wanted to worship him. Hallelujah. Bow down and, and humble themselves. Do you know, this is something very powerful. Their worship of Jesus was the best thing they ever did. Now, these are men that had political power. These are men that had money. These are men that were well-educated. These were men that helped rule nations. But yet, the most important thing they ever did was when they bowed down in worship and give gifts to a baby Jesus. The best of their life was in worship. You don't put enough value on your worship to Jesus. It should be the best thing to do. It should, your personal best should be your worship to God. How many people here were valedictorians in school? Wouldn't that have been cool? I was so far from being the valedictorian at my school. <laughs> they had another name for me, but I won't call, tell you what it is. But um, I was not even close. My brother, on the other hand... But that's another story. But, um, and my sister, by that way. But I was not them. And, um, but can you, you know, you become the Battle of Victoria and you catch the final touchdown in a Super Bowl game and, and you think that that's the best of the best. That's the best of your day. That's what you dream about. What the best of our days should be, worship unto God. You're not believing me. You're not. You need to get a hold of it. You need to get this in your, in your soul. That the best of who you are should be what you give to God and worship. The, the, your, your greatest achievement should not be building a building or accomplishing some financial treat. The, 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 the best of your best should be your worship unto God. 
You know, we put creativity in so many things. We put energy into so many things. The three wise men put energy and, and creativity into their worship. They didn't just pick any gifts. They, 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 they studied and they figured out what would be the best thing to bring to the king of kings. And that should be, you should be about worship. You should think about how to be a great worshiper. You should. The best of your best should be your worship. In John chapter 4, Jesus is having a very interested, heated discussion. Now, let's be honest. How many people have ever eavesdropped on a heated discussion? Come on, you're in line at the grocery store, and then the next aisle, you know, there's a little spat going on. You're like, you don't want to look. No, that would be improper. So you take, you know, this, you know, these big ear things, and you know, and uh, well, I'm going to give you permission. We're going to jump into a heated discussion that a woman at a well had with Jesus. We're going to get right to the hot pot part. John chapter 4, verse 19. It says, A woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. He just told her that she was living in sin and gave her all the details. And then she asked a theological question. Our father worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will worship will you worship the Father. Everybody say it's not about a place. Hallelujah. Go, worship goes much deeper than the place. For, keep reading. Verse 22, it says, You worship that which you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now when true worshipers will worship the Father. Everybody say in spirit and truth. Will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now, who is this woman? Um, who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to a woman at the well that he just revealed this woman w was in pretty much long term sinful relationships. Okay? And, 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 and here he says to her, God is looking for people to worship the Father. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to a people who might feel a little insecure about their value before an all-holy God. And he's saying, hey, 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 the Father is looking for the likes of you who will worship in spirit and truth, who will put their past in the past and, and move on to a holy and righteous life. Am I making any sense? He's looking for those who will worship. He's looking for people. He's not looking for angels. He's not looking for seraphim or cherubim. He's looking for people who will worship the Father in spirit and truth. He goes on. He says, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. The one, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, there's a lot we can get from this, but the first thing that I, wanna, I want you to, to, to get is that revelation of who Jesus is comes in the midst of a revelation of one's calling to worship. As this woman heard her calling to be a worshiper, she then heard the calling, the revelation of who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was the Savior. But the revelation of who God is, the revelation of who Jesus is, comes alongside of our revelation to be a worshiper. And as you get a revelation that you are called to be worshiper, you'll get greater and greater revelation of who God is. I'm sick and tired of people saying, God doesn't talk to me. Let me tell you something. God is always talking. Hallelujah. God is always speaking. He's speaking in his word, and he's speaking in your spirit, man. And if you learn to worship and be in the presence of God, you'll know what God is saying to you. Now, you might never hear an audible voice from God, but you'll hear the voice of God. 
but it comes to worshipers, giving yourself to worshipers, becoming a worship, a worshiper. Do you know that you, like this woman at the well, that you are called to be a worshiper? I don't care where you are in your spiritual life. I don't care if you're struggling with alcohol. I don't care if you're struggling with with stupidity. I don't care if you're struggling with religious pride. I don't care where you are. You need to know that you are called to be a worshiper. You need to let let, let aside those drugs and alcohol. You need to let aside your stupidity. You need to let aside your, your, your religious pridefulness. And you need to humble yourself and become a worshiper. Somebody say amen. Becoming a worshiper is our calling from God. We are being called to worship God with our whole life. That's truth. We are being called to worship God with our whole heart. That's spirit. With worship. When we worship with our whole life. When we worship with our whole heart, when we worship in spirit and in truth, hallelujah, with that worship will come insight and understanding into who God is and who Jesus is. This is the real deal. When Abraham worshiped, he had insight. When, when the wise men worshiped, they had insight into who God was. It is clear from Jesus' conversation that becoming a worshiper is not a side issue of one's life, but is the main call of every believer. In Jesus' name, I call your ears to be open and your heart to be alive, that you would hear that you are called to be a worshiper. In the name of holy Jesus Christ, I pray that God would stir your heart. Just say, Lord, stir me to worship. Lord, stir me to praise. Lord, stir me to give you the honor do your name, O oh God. Lord, let me see you and humble myself before mighty God and worship you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. 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 See, worship is personal. You have to personally worship God. How many people know I only have one wife? And how many people know that's a good thing? How many people know I couldn't handle more than Maria? (laughs) Amen? How many people here have multiple children? How many people know you want each of those children to love you? You want to hear, Mommy, I love you. Daddy, I love you from each of your children. You call each of your children to love you, to communicate that appreciation. Well, God calls all of his children to be worshipers. It's got to be a personal thing. Become a worshiper in spirit and truth is what the Father is seeking you to becoming. It's not like a, you know, a side issue. This is really what God wants. What he really wants from you is to become a worshiper. And then you might be also a doctor. You might be a worshiper and you might also be a pastor. You might be a worshiper. You might be an elder in this church. But what you're really called to is to be a worshiper. You might, be a, you, you might be on the, the singing on the worship team, but your singing is not the most important thing publicly. What's most important is that you are a worshiper. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, um, how many people know that David was a mighty man of God? Do you know why David was a mighty man of God? It's because he worshiped the mighty God. David worshipped the mighty God, and as he worshipped the mighty God, he saw God as mighty. Lift up your head, all your gates, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? Mighty in battle. He is Jehovah Zaviot. He is the Lord of the armies of heaven. That, you know how that revelation came? 
It came because he worshiped God. And who is God? God is mighty God. As he worshiped the mighty God, he received might within himself. His worship was personal. And it literally, his worship changed his personhood. He became like the God he worshiped. As he worshiped God, he saw God. And as he saw God, he became like that God. He, he, his worship was personal. You know, I, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible is Psalm 23. Sometimes I drive my wife crazy how many times I read Psalm 23. But I get fed by Psalm 23 because I can see it. Everybody say worship is personal. What was, what was um, David? He was, what was his job? Shepherd. Okay, so he knew how to take care of sheep. He spent most of his life, most of his waking hours while he was doing it, taking care of the sheep. He had to strategize about taking care of sheep. He had to plan about feeding them, about getting them water, about making sure that they were healthy. Okay, he was trained shepherd. Okay, so here is one night. His sheep are out in the field. It's all dark except for the beautiful stars. And his, he's sort of leaning against a rock. And the stars are in the sky. Hallelujah. And I want you to know David was a worshiper. So he's looking up at those stars and he says, oh, majestic is your name. Your name is above all the earth. Your beauty and your splendor shined. And he's, he put a beautiful melody to that and he started worshiping for the beauty, God, the beauty of splendorness and the glory. Hallelujah. His majesty. And then he started to think about how good God was. You are good. And he started to sing a little diddly song about the goodness of God. My God is good in the morning and in the evening. And when the sun goes down, my God is gooder than good and gooder than the greatest. He's great in majesty. His love shines. And he started to sing about the love of God. And as he was worshiping God, all of a sudden a veil was taken away. And he was like, oh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And he started worshiping me. He leads me beside still waters. And it was worship going up. How he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, hallelujah, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Hallelujah, I fear no evil. You're with me. And what was it? It was worship song because God was revealing to him. You, you anoint my head with oil. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My head is anointed with your holy oil. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Goodness and mercy. Hallelujah. Follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. You're so good. You're my shepherd. My God's mind. And a revelation came to him. The Lord was his shepherd. Hallelujah. And it was personable because he knew about shepherds. And so he, the spirit of his creativity and the revelation of God being the shepherd mingled together to create a song that people are still being blessed by and people are still being worshipped by and people are still being comforted by. Why? Because his worship became personal. And, am I making any sense today? And, and you need to make your worship personable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are two truths here. As you worship God, you see God more. And as the second truth is as you see God more, you have more to worship about. As he worshiped God, he saw God clearer. Worship is a living thing. God calls you to worship him. You see God, you worship God. You worship God, you see God. Who here needs to see God more? Raise your hand. How many people need to see God more? What's the answer? Worship God more. How many people need to worship God more? What's the answer? See God more. But how you see God more is you worship God more. You worship God more, you see God more. You'll see God more, you'll be able to worship God more. Amen. Worship is personable. Person. There are 13 and 14 personal pronouns in this six verses. Um, 
Um, I believe there's at least six me's, four my's, and three I's. Listen to Psalm 23 again. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Even though I walk through the valley, I fear no evil. They comfort me. You prepare before me a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And there needs to be a revelation of making worship per- personal. He saved me. Hallelujah. I need to worship God. He saved me. His blood washes me. He forgives me. He heals me. He suffered for me. Jesus suffered for me. Hallelujah. Jesus died for me. Hallelujah. Jesus is with me. Hallelujah. Jesus watches over me. Jesus loves me. Hallelujah. He loves me. He really loves me. Hallelujah. He even likes me. Hallelujah. He's my father and he still loves me. Hallelujah. You need to get personal with God in your worship. How many people here have been loved by the Father? Somebody say, He loves me. How many people have been forgiven by the Father? Somebody say, He forgives me. How many people have been comforted by God? He comforts me. I'm talking about making your worship personable. God has done great things in your life. He's had mercy upon you. Sure, you still have some struggles. Hallelujah, but you need to get get personal about your worship. Now, right now, thank God, no, seriously, what has God done for you? Get personal, start right now, stand up and start worshiping for what he's done in your life. I'm not done, right now, you guys are too quiet today, hallelujah. Father, I thank you, oh God, I thank you, oh God, okay, okay, hallelujah. Stay standing, I want you to stop clapping, it's too easy to clap. I want you to get personal. I want you to start thanking God out loud, praising God for the things he's done in your life. Father, Lord, Lord, you saved me, Lord. Father, Lord, I wasn't following you, Lord. I didn't seek you. You sought me and you saved me. You forgave my sins, oh God. Father, you showed me that you were holy. You opened up my eyes, oh God. Father, I wasn't living a holy life, but you taught me how to live holy, oh God. Hallelujah, you took me out of a life of sin, oh God. Hallelujah, you've been with me through all these years, oh God. You've kept me, oh God. You kept me in some dark places, oh God. You've been with me in my hard times, oh God. And Father, you keep leading me closer to you, Lord. And I thank you for it. Now you can give God a praise offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, sit down. Sit down. I want everybody to look me in the eye. I'm going to get real serious. I'm going to get real serious. Look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. Is everybody looking me in the eye? Okay. You're not great at that. What you just did was only okay. You need to start practice giving God praise. Okay. No, seriously. And there's no judgment in that. You were, you were like pretty half-hearted about that. You know what I mean? You were worried about people listening to you or whatever, whatever, whatever. You need to go home. And every day you need to practice becoming a worshiper. Becoming a, you need to practice making your worship personable. You need to, you need to like the, the, the wise men, they prepared to worship God. And you need to grow in your worship for God. You still love me? Okay. Do you agree with me? Okay, good. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, how many people have ever heard the the phrase, a new song? How many people in the Bible says we need to sing a new song? Do you know what a new song is? And I, this is, this is a Ralphism. I've never heard anybody else say this. Your new song is a you song. Your new song, and you, Y-O-U, you, okay, I'm not, your new song is a you song. It's personal, you know, um, and don't, it doesn't always have to be a religious you song. It very well sometimes will be a religious you song, but sometimes your you song is, is you know, I got, how many people know pastor has a puppy? He's a 12-year-old puppy, but it's still his puppy. How many people know Pastor and Maria love their dog? Okay? We love our dogs. Okay? And you want to hear something cool? Father, I just thank you that my puppy's got a tail. I love to see that dog wag his tail. Hallelujah. That's right, Anna. You do too. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes we start thanking God for things like simple things like our 
tails that wag, and ice cream cones. Father, I thank you that you made ice cream. And Lord, my wife's getting into a new hobby. She has bird feeders. And Lord, you're bringing all these beautiful birds from all over the area. And Lord, I thank you for those pretty birds. Amen. But your new song sometimes is a you song. And you gotta, you got to make up a song to God. you got to tell Him what are you happy about, you know? How many people are, are happy that they woke up this morning? So maybe you start up your song, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that I woke up this morning. Some, some of you just start with the basics. You don't have to get too complicated here. But you got to make a song unto God. Hallelujah, Lord, I thank you, God, that my daughter's alive and thriving. And, and Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. Make it personable. What are the things about God that he's revealed to you? How many people know something about God? What do you know about God? Tell me. Help me out here. He's faithful. Amen. Praise him for his faithfulness. What else do you know about God? Merciful. Merciful. Amen. We need it, huh? Wait. Merciful. What else do you know about God? <laughs> he's loving. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. What else do you know about God? He's a healer. He's forgiver. Yes. He's our Savior. He restores. He's our forever friend. How many people know at least three things about God? Do you know His mercy endures forever? Amen. So you need to use that. If you know something about God, if He's holy, if if He's doing something in your life, showing Himself, use that in your praise and worship. Come on, somebody say amen. Make it personable. Do you know in our song service, there are times that we're in the middle of a song and all of a sudden we, they stop singing words. Maybe there's some music. Maybe um, some of the singers are singing, I love you, Lord, with all my heart. And another one puts another melody in. And it's almost like they're just singing a song. That's, the words are not on the screen. They're just singing something in the spirit. You know, that's a time for you to make a new song. That's a time to say, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that my, tail, my dog's tails wag. And, and Father, for all the beautiful birds, Lord, I thank you, Lord. Maybe you had a struggle with sin this week. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you forgave my sins, Lord. Maybe God God's teaching you of his holiness. Lord, I thank you, O oh God, that you are holy God. And Father, help me to see your holiness. And you just, you make your own song up. Everybody say a new song is a me song. Praise God, it's my song that God wants to give me. Praise God. There are three important questions that you need to ask yourself. It says, what do you know? This is God asking you three important questions in worship. It says, the first question he's asking is, what do you know about me? God is asking you, worship me for who you know I am. Okay, the second thing is what I've done for you. Has God done anything for anybody lately? Worship for him for what he's done for you. And the third is, what what does he mean to you? He's saying, what do I mean to you? What have I done for you? Worship me about it. What do I mean to you? How many people love God? I love God. You know, for better, for worse... I'm definitely not the best-looking pastor, the best-singing pastor, the best-preaching pastor. But let me tell you something. I love God. I'm definitely not the smartest pastor. Sometimes I'm the silliest pastor, though. But one thing I want to be is the pastor that loves God. And I want, I want my worship to reflect that love for God. And I want you to love God. And I want you to let him know. He wants to let you know. God's asking you, do you love me? Do you? Do you? Do you respond? Do you love me? And this is not me. God is saying, do you love me? What are you going to say? Say, God, I love you. Father, I love you. Do you really want to worship me? Then do it. Man, do you really want to worship me? Worship me. God is saying to you, make it personal. Make it personal. The Father is seeking worshipers who will worship, hallelujah, in spirit and truth. Amen. You need to become a greater worshiper because you need to know and see God. Amen. Faith, now listen to me. Faith comes at the bidding of revelation of the greatness of our God. And a revelation of the greatness of our God comes from worship. Personally worshiping God. God will give you a vision. I believe the reason why I have strong faith is because I worship God. I worship God. Amen. I'd like to close with um, 
two scriptures. In Psalm 66, verse 2, it says, Sing the glory of his name and make his praise glorious. The next one is, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name and worship the Lord in holy array. Make it personal. And let me just say this. Make worship the best thing you do. Make it be your best. You know how you give your best? Yeah. How many people know some chefs give their best to that, that meal? And then you could taste it. And then you have cooks like me that their eggs turn gray. At least that's what my children told me. Okay? Uh, it's not my, just not my gift. What can I say? But make worship the best thing that you do.